Okay. Uh, I'm going to keep my mask on because we are on a mask mandate here at the at GW, um, and we are seated close enough together that it uh, remains an important public health precaution for us. Um, I would like to welcome everyone this morning to our discussion on the role of cities in international affairs. What should international affairs schools teach future leaders? So this is a little bit of a different cut on this kind of a question as we think at the Elliott School about what we should be teaching as we think about how we can strategize our, our curriculum in the months and years ahead. We are exceptionally fortunate to have a panel of all stars this morning, all of whom have deep experience in both the life of cities and in international affairs. They understand the role that cities play in shaping politics, economies, cultures, and values. They understand how globalization shapes cities and how cities shape the world. So I cannot think of a better group of panelists to help us collectively think together about what we can be doing at the Elliott School to teach about the rise of cities in international affairs. Now, as everyone here is aware, the question always comes up, aren't nation states the key players in international affairs? Cities aren't members of the UN, countries are. Um, I think that we're all also aware that we're at a point now this century where for the first time in history, more than half of humanity live in cities. Two thirds of humanity will live in cities by the year 2050. Cities are the engines of innovation, the drivers of change, the future of our planet. So our focus this morning is not only on cities, but it's on the next generation. So we need to be thinking about what the future practitioners of international affairs need to know about cities and what in turn do city officials and administrators need to know about the world. For us, the relevant question emerging from the conversation is what should the Elliott School of International Affairs teach tomorrow's leaders about cities? So I hope this will be a very open discussion on that front with a lot of ideas and recommendations that we can consider. What kind of education and skills do our students need for success in this space? So each of the panelists with us this morning are practitioners and thinkers whose work I have admired. They are all at the leading edge of thinking about the intersection of cities and international affairs. And as I mentioned, this is a strategic priority for us at the Elliott School. We're looking to grow our work in this space. We're looking to grow our outreach to policy communities, including at the local level. And we're really thinking hard about our ability to prepare our students for job opportunities in international affairs, but at the local level. So as we see the rise of cities forming new organizations, new consultative committees, new modes of connecting with each other towards collective action in the case of climate change, or towards sharing best practices in other kinds of areas, we can also think about this as a real democratization of the practice of international affairs. So from my perspective, there's much here to welcome and for all of us to be thinking more about. And that's why it is an honor for us today to be able to bring all four of you together in this setting. And I'm so delighted that you can join our discussion. So as we will proceed this morning, we're going to alternate between our virtual panelists and our in-person panelists in the following order, uh, Ambassador Nina Hashidian, Ms. Penny Abewardna, Dr. Ian Klaus, and Mr. Luis Renta. And I will provide uh, longer bios immediately before introducing each one of our panelists. So you will not forget uh, if I do it all at the top. So let me begin first with Ambassador Mina Hashidian, who is joining us at 8 a.m. Pacific time from Los Angeles, I believe. Thank you for, for joining us at what may not be the most convenient time for you. Um, let me just offer a brief introduction so everyone is aware of all that you have done. Ambassador Mina Hashidian, uh, is the Deputy Mayor of International Affairs for the City of Los Angeles. Mayor Eric Garcetti appointed Ambassador Hashidian to be the first Deputy Mayor of International Affairs for the City. Her office connects the world to LA and LA to the world. It builds relationships with local and global partners to bring more jobs, opportunity, culture, ideas, and visitors to Los Angeles. Her office works to elevate the city's international leadership on equity, sustainability, and innovation. Her office also oversees preparations for the 2028 Olympic and Paralympic Games. From 2014 to 2017, Ambassador Hashidian served as the second U.S. Ambassador to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN. During her tenure, she helped establish the U.S. ASEAN Women's Leadership Academy and grew the youth program to over 100,000 members. She received the State Department Superior Honor Award for her service. 
She is also a founder of Women Ambassadors Serving America, a group of some 200 current and former ambassadors, as well as the Leadership Council for Women in National Security. Earlier, Ambassador Hashigan was a senior fellow and a senior vice president at the Center for American Progress. Prior to that, she was the director of the RAND Center for Asia Pacific Policy. She also served on the staff of the National Security Council. She received her BS from Yale University and her JD from Stanford Law School. So let me turn things now to Ambassador Hashigian. Thank you again for joining us, and we would love to hear what you think about cities and international affairs, and what should we be teaching future leaders in this space? Well, thank you so much, and thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here with uh, with you and with such a, you know, my esteemed uh, colleagues and panelists. They're all terrific. Um, can I just ask a quick question? Are there students listening or in the room? I can't tell. Yes. Okay. In that case, I will start with them and say hello, students. Uh, and I hope that you're well and taking care of your mental health as well as your schoolwork at this you know, really uncertain time for geopolitics as well as for health and community and democracy. Um, and I'll say that if you're lucky, you will have a long life and career. So pace yourself and whatever academic stress you're feeling now, uh, it'll fade soon enough and your grades really just won't matter in the long term. <laughs> Don't tell your teachers I said that. So um, moving on to the substance of what we're talking about. Um, what I love about cities is that uh, they're the ones, we are the ones who have to make things work on the ground for humans. And the conversations in City Hall are very different from ones at policy forums in Washington that I typically hear. Um, it's absolutely critical that the president sets direction and Congress delivers funding. And we work so well and regularly with this president. This administration feels like a wind uh, at our back more than like a tornado coming straight for us and turning up what we've built and it's wonderful um, but cities still have to turn policy into reality which is always more complicated um, so if you take vaccines i mean i think the one thing the trump administration did right was to accelerate the production of vaccines and then the biden team stepped in to figure out how to get them across the country but it was still then our job to figure out how to get them into arms um, which required a massive logistical lift uh, in a city of 4 million people and a county of 10 million people. And we thought we were doing pretty well when we set up a vast facility at Dodger Stadium and hundreds of other places across the city and made it you know, as easy as we thought we could to, for people to get vaccinated. But part of, then we looked at the numbers um, and part of what I appreciate so much uh, about Mayor Garcetti is that he insists that we measure everything. Uh, and we found a serious gap, both racially and in terms of income, about who was getting vaccinated. Uh, we had a, you know, a map of zip codes that showed us where we were falling short. So we had to pivot to a whole different strategy um, that ended up using uh, mobile vans to deliver vaccines straight into those communities with the lowest uptake. People who didn't uh, trust government or who couldn't get time off work or who didn't have the internet to sign up easily, um, although we've always had you know, phone options as well. And then we we're able to close the gap. Uh, so turning to what this means for foreign policy, the job of my office, which is now only four and a half years old, I think I'm still the only deputy mayor for international affairs in the United States. Um, it's uh, the touchstone that we always follow is, are we delivering value for Angelinos? And the discipline of asking that question is essential and it's valuable because my office is small, um, although my team is you know, outrageously qualified and um, productive, we still have to prioritize constantly, um, which you know, at the moment is very challenging because LA for the first time ever is going to be hosting a major diplomatic summit in June, uh, the Summit of the Americas. We're very excited about that. Um, and it's weird to me that the second largest city in the United States has never done anything like this, but we haven't. So anyway, we're busy. Um, but we, we frame our work in terms of four goals that we're trying to achieve. So first is to create jobs and economic opportunity. Uh, the second is to deliver skills and experiences, global skills and experiences and exposure to young people. Um, third is to solve problems, world problems that affect Los Angeles. And fourth is to strengthen our domestic and our international partnerships. So just to give you a sense of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm gonna go through each one of these and talk about some of the stuff that we do. 
So um, in terms of jobs and economic opportunities, this is the one that's the most straightforward. It's also the one probably most prevalent across the United States in terms of cities and states trying to do this. So both help, helping exporters to export and, um, and uh, attracting foreign direct investment. Uh, it's interesting to me that we've, Los Angeles never had a kind of a formal FDI program. Much smaller cities have had great programs and we didn't. So we've started uh, relatively recently a public private partnership called Global LA, uh, which is going to be doing this work uh, for us and with us. Um, we also, major events are also a source of, of jobs and we're working closely with the 2028 um, team that's in a separate nonprofit to figure out how to make sure that uh, they hire locally and that they um, offer procurement opportunities to uh, small, medium, uh, women-owned, minority-owned businesses in Los Angeles uh, uh, as we prepare for the 2028 Olympics. This will be the third time LA hosts the Olympics, the first time we're hoping uh, hosting the Paralympics. Um, turning to young skill, to skills for young people, we started a program to send community college students overseas on their first trips. These are 95% uh, students of color. Yeah. They are 60% first generation American. You know, we lost you for a second. Could you back up by two sentences? We had a surprise outage on the screen, but we're back now. Fun. Uh, did you lose me at the games, Paralympic game, Olympic and Paralympic games? For young people and uh, young people. Okay. So in terms of delivering skills, <laughs> global kind of skills and experiences to young people, which is probably my favorite part of my job. Um, we started a program called Maya, Mayor's Young Ambassador Program, that it sends uh, students overseas, community college students, on their on their first uh, trips, and um, these are. 95% students of color. They are 60% first generation to go to college, 60% first generation Americans. And about uh, a third of them have never been on an airplane before this, these trips. So we get passports and um, work with, they're all funded in different ways, but they, we've sent um, students to uh, Japan, to Taiwan, to Paris, uh, to Egypt, to Mexico, um, and we have another Paris trip and an Armenia trip coming up this summer. We had another group that just came back from Mexico City. Um, and those of you who've had a chance to travel know how very eye-opening uh, even one trip can be. We also work with high school students and pair, pair high schools and consulates uh, to have, uh, to share, you know, all kinds of programmatic activity. So, uh, then in the third bucket, which is solving global problems, I mean, the one that we work on most internationally is climate. Uh, Mayor Garcetti was chair of the C40, which is a big network of mega cities that are all trying to reduce their carbon emissions. And at COP, he was the only non-nation state leader and was able to say there that um, we had gotten 1,049 cities to pledge to reduce their carbon in half by 2030 and uh, net zero by 2050. If you put all that together, it would have been like the fourth or fifth largest uh, climate pledge that there was that, you know, at that COP that day. Uh, we've also started a gender equity network for cities. There wasn't one before and, you know, mayors have a lot of power over the lives of women. So that includes Mexico City, which is now the chair. We've rotated it to them. Uh, London, Tokyo, uh, Freetown in Sierra Leone, uh, Barcelona, and we added Buenos Aires recently. Um, we've also, um, with Penny's leadership, been one of the cities to, um, to uh, offer a VLR, a, a voluntary local review to the UN. We've done that twice now. Um, and we've, we measure our progress for the sustainable development goals uh, on a live platform um, that anyone can see. And we've been active in terms of democracy too, and let's come back to that. Uh, finally, in terms of strengthening our partnerships, we work closely with a very large consular corps that we have here. We have massive diaspora groups um, who are very um, interested in what's happening in their home countries. Uh, we, you know, we, have, we regularly host uh, heads of state and ministers. And we do things with national governments. Uh, one is like a citizens commission that we have between Mexico and Los Angeles. 
another recent example is signing a uh, transportation, well, a, like a mobility um, memorandum of understanding with the UK transportation minister who was here a couple of weeks ago. And then we participate in many city networks, which we can talk about uh, more, but U20, strong city network, and then the Pact of Free Cities. Um, and that brings me to Ukraine. So a few years ago, LA joined this network called the Pact of Free Cities, which is a pretty amazing um, network started by the four uh, Eastern European capitals um, of the Visegrad Four. So these are like Hungary, uh, Warsaw, these, these uh, sorry, Hungary and Poland, um, Budapest and Warsaw. Um, these are nation states that are kind of tending uh, a liberal or authoritarian, but their cities are still progressive. Um, so, and they want to do, they want to protect LGBTQ rights and do climate um, uh, work and they are uh, stymied at the national level. So they started a group um, of, of, that is in support of democratic freedoms uh, and democracy. And so it was mostly, um, Kind of solidarity up until recently and then the that network because it already existed was able to mobilize around ukraine and make key a member right away and then actually like pledge to take refugees and deliver stuff to uh warsaw so it could go across the border um so it actually became a very active network that was actually helping um on the ground so in terms of what students need to know they need to know, first of all, that cities and states and provinces are increasingly doing this work. Although American cities are very late to the game, I would say, my office is considered very large with seven people and um, only Penny's former office had more staff. Shanghai has a hundred people doing foreign policy, uh, just as an example, and many other cities in the rest of the world are much more active. Um, I was meeting yesterday, I was in a meeting yesterday with a French diplomat who was assigned to the city of Paris. Um, and we could really use that kind of capacity in our cities and states. Um, anyway, we're getting there, but I doubt many schools even know this field exists. So this forum itself, I think is a very good start because I, I've believed long that cities and states can be very useful to us in foreign policy if we're asked to be. Um, they need to know how it is both different and the same as at the national level when you're executing foreign policy um, so that they can take advantage if they're working at the federal level of what we can bring, solutions, yeah, community engagement, soft power. Um, and they need both diplomatic grounding and civic skills if they're going to go into uh, this line of work, working for a city or for a state. Um, but most of all, it's not what they need to know, but what we need uh, which is their thinking on um, where cities can go from here. We have some big structural problems that need uh, addressing. And to name three, like first, the State Department has no capacity to work with us right now. Um, they did uh, earlier during Ian's time, but now there is now one guy that they've hired relatively recently and that's great. Um, and there's the prospect for more, but that's still a, a gap. Um, and the UN, as you mentioned, is supposed to solve challenges like migration and pandemics and climate change, but cities have no status. And, uh, and then that gets to the final challenge, which is financing for projects that will actually solve problems, but that always go through the nation state level when it comes to the uh, international banks. So I'll leave those uh, for you to think about and look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Xi, and that is a lot for us to think about. We're definitely going to come back. I, I think it's going to be likely that our panelists have uh, additional comment on many of the issues that you raised. Um, let me introduce now uh, Penny Abiwardena. She, she's sitting next to me, she served as New York City's Commissioner for International mm -hmm. Affairs from 2014 to 2021, so holding the entire international affairs portfolio and working with the largest diplomatic corps in the world. Under her leadership, New York City implemented a series of award-winning programs with the international community, ranging from youth empowerment to city and local government leadership. They focused on global issues like climate change, sustainable development, and rebuilding after the COVID-19 pandemic. Prior to her role in government, Penny was the director of the women's program at the Clinton Global Initiative. She is on the board of directors of the Center for Reproductive Rights and the United Nations Fund for International Partnerships. 
She also serves on the Innovation Advisory Committee for the 92nd Street Y and is co-chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Futures Council on Cities of Tomorrow. French President Emmanuel Macron recently appointed Penny a knight in France's National Order of Merit for her global leadership on diplomacy, <laughs> human rights, and sustainability. In December 2020, she was awarded the Golden Helsinki Medal for creating a global sustainable development network of local governments. She is a graduate of the University of Southern California and completed her Master of International Affairs at Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs. A great school. <laughs> um, so looking, looking forward to what you have to say. I, I know you were an innovator, a creator of the voluntary local reviews. We are interested in all of your thoughts and recommendations about how we should be thinking and teaching about this area. Absolutely. It's actually, I wanted to start first with thank you for having me. And it's also really fun. I've been out of office for the last four months. And these were four of my favorite, three of my favorite people to work with <laughs> over the last eight years. So I'm sorry, Nina and Ian, that you aren't actually here, but it's really great to be on this panel with you guys. Um, one thing I wanted to start with was I haven't been to DC in three years. And yesterday I had lunch with Anne-Marie Slaughter of New America. And something she said that she is constantly telling all the students she interacts with is don't go to State Department, go try to work for Penny or Nina's office. And I think that could be a good starting point is to start directing young people to local government. Um, just to have that experience while they're in school, just to understand the power that we can have. So, you know, when I was appointed in 2014, unlike Nina's role, which was created in 20, 2018, what year was Nina? 2017, um, my agency is over 60 years old because New York City is host to the largest diplomatic corps. And so this was something that was created to ensure that the diplomatic corps could have a good operational dynamic with the city of New York. When I took over, it was just shocking to have a pretty decent sized staff that was largely just focused on the reactionary of the diplomatic incidents of UNGA and the security protocol. And something that the mayor and I talked about at that time was New York City is as large, if not larger, than 141 countries. Mm -hmm. We believe that government should work for its people. If we can get something done in New York around gender equity or you know, new sanitation strategies, why are we not creating a platform to exchange best practices with the global community? Being host to the UN was an extraordinary opportunity. So in 2015, when the world agreed, um, came together around the sustainable development goals, we actually mapped the synergies with our one NYC development agenda that the mayor had launched in April, 2015. And I think because of our really strong equity lens around sustainability and resiliency, we had so much commonality with the SDGs that we decided to create a program called Global Vision Urban Action. And you know, something that I do think is really important for students to really appreciate too, is that you can be innovative and you can be entrepreneurial in government. And I think that's something that we don't talk about enough. Obviously you get mired in bureaucratic crap, but to Nina's point, if you can approach what you do with a certain degree of diplomacy, building relationships, it is actually extraordinary how you can create and innovate within a government infrastructure. So we created Global Vision Urban Action, and then essentially we had to hit the ground um, and start explaining to everybody the value add of why you're running you know, transportation, Polly Tottenberg, here in New York City, why it's important for you to connect with your counterparts around the world. Because what we wanted to do was exchange best practices to accelerate impact in the community. This was not about who's doing the new thing, it's about what's working and how do we get there. And so, that program was launched and we, of course, you know, and I love Nina's program around sending community college kids outside, um, you know, to other countries. We were, we were limited by budget, so we were a little bit different in that we created our junior ambassador program in 2015. We have the largest diplomatic corps and we have kids in Staten Island who'd never been to Manhattan. So the UN feels like it's in another country. So how do we then connect these kids with this diplomatic corps, have them see, the, see themselves as part of the global community of action? And so the junior ambassador program really took the SDGs, asked these kids to think about, to learn about the SDGs and what's an issue in their community that they can activate on. And so it was this duality of being able to feel like you're part of this global community that's focused on climate change, but then recognizing that the South Bronx River, for example, is one of the dirtiest waterways and SDG 14, they wanna clean that up. And so that was one way that we were able to then get 
the policy experts and administra administrators with Global Vision Urban Action thinking about how they can work with their counterparts in other countries, but also having young people activate in their communities to start getting <coughs> that sense of civic duty and diplomacy at such a young age. So, you know, and I think about since it was eight years, it really fell into phases. So that first phase was really building this connectivity between the UN and the international community and New Yorkers. The second phase is, you know, and this is what's so fun now that I'm out of government, I don't have to censor myself so much and that's so <laughs> wonderful. Um, the Trump administration was oddly a really unique opportunity. Um, most Americans and definitely not our international counterparts appreciate the power that local governments <clears throat> have, right? So whether it was how you know, Trump at the time was criticizing community policing with the NYPD. At the end of the day, it's the mayor of New York City that has a control over the, our policies related to one of the largest you know, policing groups in the world. Um, with climate change, you know, we actually were, we knew that Trump was gonna pull out of the Paris Climate Accord within 24 hours. We became the first city to sign an executive order committing New York City to the Paris Climate Accord. But it was it, that opportunity with, um, with the Trump administration was quite fascinating because you had here in DC, a national government abdicating its responsibility on issues like climate change and wait till I talk about COVID um, when New York City was at the center, but was focused on climate change. Um, that really offered, you know, working with the US Conference of Mayors and other cities to really drive that agenda and show the power of local governments. And I will say every time the secretary general during that period was like, what are you gonna do? Trump doesn't believe in, um, in climate science. He's like, he just pivoted directly into look at what cities are doing. Look at what New York City, look at what LA, look at what the private sector is doing. So it became this extraordinary opportunity for cities to really show up during that period. Another example I have was in 2018, the global compact on migration was being negotiated at the UN. And a number of cities got together and went to Louise Arbor at the time, who was the person that was a special envoy um, that the SG had appointed to to lead the efforts on the Global Compact on Migration, um, you know, we don't control what happens at the borders, but at the end of the day, we're the ones who have to navigate our new neighbors once they're here. So you need to learn about the strategies that cities are implementing to ensure that this, um, you know, this community is taken care of. And so I think there are just these slow opportunities over that Trump administration period that really helped us reaffirm uh, the value and the importance of um, of local government strength. And that was part of the reason that my team and I, we were looking at the UN. We don't have a seat at the table. We're going one by one, right? Global Compact on Migration, the Paris Climate Accord. But why aren't we using the SDGs as this common <coughs> framework for us to all talk to each other across borders? And that was the work that we had slowly been building on with the Global Vision Urban Action, but something that really took off when we realized national governments are submitting voluntary national reviews during the high level political forum. Why don't we create the voluntary local review and create an opportunity for cities to show up? And we had, and we were very thoughtful about the fact that, you know, I used to get this a lot, but you're New York City, you should totally do it. You have staff, you have up. And that <clears> wasn't <throat> the point. It was the point was how do we get into the conversation, get a seat at the table, recognizing that no matter politically where the winds are going, cities at the local level have to care about climate change, about gender equity, about all these issues related to the SDGs. And we wanna be able to have a platform in which to do that. And it's interesting because, you know, by the time I left, UN DESA and UN Habitat had fully taken on the voluntary local review, but it was fully city led in 2018, 2019. Helsinki was the second city that joined us for this. And that was really important to have a small city that said, we actually see the value of doing this. And then Sierra Leone, uh, Freetown, was I think the third or fourth city to join, but we needed to show that this was like a global effort. And so that, you know, and I wanna share this with the students in the sense that this is about being entrepreneurial, right? This is about seeing a gap and then creating opportunity. Um, one of my favorite conversations with um, the mayor was prepping him for a, a World Economic Forum speech. And the, lang the language was, you know, New York City is the first city to have done a voluntary local review. And he's like, how do you know some tiny little city in India hasn't done it, for example, Penny? And I was like, because you made it up, sir. <laughs> like, you literally made it up. And so, you know, and that's the kind of, um, I think, 
exciting opportunity there is in this um, in this field of local government um, and the connectivity. Nina, you know, described a lot of the different networks, and you know, where we were thinking is a voluntary local review going to become a network? Is it going to become a movement? How are people going to to really connect with this? And what was so interesting is that during COVID, we saw a huge spike in cities committing to um, to the voluntary local review. By the time I left, we had 350 local governments around the world um, taking advantage of this. And so, you know, at the end of the day, I want to, you know, let Luis and Ian speak. Um, the four years of Trump really showed, I think, Americans and much less, you know, students at the Elliott School that power of local government. And I think we just need to continue to drive that agenda, recognizing how important that is and activating. You don't have to commit to working local government forever, but I have to say the few years that I worked in it have been some of the most defining. If I did this in college, it would have been such an extraordinary experience to understand the layers there. Um, I, will, I will close on that, but um, I'm really excited that you are thinking about it and look forward to the conversation. Thank you, that was great. Let me turn now to our next virtual panelist, Dr. Ian Klaus. Uh, Dr. Ian Klaus is a senior fellow on global cities and foreign policy at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, which does an annual conference that is focused on precisely this. He also serves as director of research and policy for the Global Parliament of Mayors and as the series editor of the AR6 Summary for Urban Policymakers. Previously, he served as a diplomatic advisor to the Urban 20 and the C40 Climate City, the C4, C40 City Climate Leadership Group. He was senior advisor for global cities at the US Department of State. In that role, he led urban diplomacy for the United States, engaging dozens of foreign ministries and development agencies on urbanization and foreign policy issues. He was deputy United States negotiator for the United Nations Conference on Housing and Sustainable Development. From 2011 to 2016, he served as a member of the policy planning staff in the office of the Secretary of State. He has been a member of the World Economic Forum's Advisory Board on the Future of Urban Development, the Creative Cities Working Group at Stanford University, a visiting fellow at the University of Pennsylvania, and the Ernest May Fellow for History and Security Studies at the Kennedy School of Government. He holds a PhD in International History from Harvard University. Thank you, Ian, for joining us. And we look forward to your thoughts as both a practitioner and a thinker on these issues. Thanks, Dean. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to, to be with you all um, today and to see, uh, as everyone else has said, so many old friends. I have to say, once when, when we were actually negotiating the, the New Urban Agenda in New York, um, one of the facilitators, the, the ambassador from Mexico, Came up to me and said, you know, if you don't um, want the other nations to know what you think about their interventions, you're not doing a very good job. And I have to say, seeing my head looming over Luis right now, and every gesture I make sort of <laughs> is affirming that he was absolutely right, and that I've learned nothing uh, in, in the subsequent years. Uh, it's, it's uh, <laughs> um, but it, it's wonderful to be here this morning. I actually. Um, uh, and re was really excited when I received this invitation uh, and thank you to, to the team of the Elliott School. Uh, in particular, because I think that that in addition to, um, we well, we face an epistemological challenge as it comes to why subnational diplomacy is important, one, and, and uh, how to do it, uh, two. And so the idea of engaging with students uh, is, really, um, is really exciting. Uh, and so I'm grateful for the opportunity. Um, I think this has been alluded to, but I'd like to make just a sort of an analytical observation at the at the outset uh, to sort of uh, as as uh, ground setting, I guess. I think over the past two decades, mayors and city governments have risen um, on influence uh, on the global stage. Um, urban perspectives are now commonplace at major multilateral meetings and international negotiations. The organization of disparate cities from different states and continents into a collective voice around pressing policy challenges is, in and of itself, I believe, a diplomatic accomplishment. One advanced uh, very much so by Penny and Nina. Um, relationships between cities, particularly through networks, have strengthened over the past decade, and this improved quality and extent of city diplomacy has been most apparent in terms of efforts to mitigate against and adapt to climate change, but also increasingly on other issues. Um, I believe, uh, Dean Ayers, you know this, uh, along with Penny, uh, Nina, and Luis, you've helped make this happen, and I expect it's, it's in part why we're here today. Um, thinking about knowledge um, and, uh, and, and open questions, 
Um, I think I have two that I'd like to throw out onto the, onto the floor for when we move into questions and, and discussion. Uh, the first is a history and the second is, is really an open question. Um, the first is why or how uh, cities matter on the global stage. And the second uh, question is, is what exactly are cities? Um, these are academic questions in the best sense of the word, I believe, but they're also important to subnational or local diplomacy. The answer to these questions influence how you make the case, both to local um, constituents and to practitioners of more traditional diplomacy, <clears throat> having made many mistakes uh, in, in, in trying to make that case, um, and how you do your job, whether you're doing it at the State Department, um, at an international organization, or in an international affairs office, perhaps the most exciting and important place to do so, as has been referenced. Uh, the first a question on, on um, how or why cities matter on the global stage, and I'll just advance a sort of intellectual history of the U.S. government's thinking on that um, as, a, as a way to sort of... Um, move forward the conversation. Um, the US government's conception of the role of cities in diplomacy, I think, has undergone notable shifts in the last decade or so. For the US State Department and the Department of Defense, and it's so exciting to be engaged in a conversation with people in Washington so close to, to Foggy Bottom, um, because some of the, the documents I think are important here are actually things that I don't need to introduce. A quadrennial reviews offer sweeping analysis and policy prescription meant to guide years of activity. These reports are laboriously prepared and heavily litigated. In the State Department's first quadrennial diplomacy and development review, QDDR, released in 2010, in which Anne Marie Slaughter referenced before had a, had a strong role, urbanization was briefly identified as a potential contributor to conflict. And that document, in the thinking of the time, cities mattered because of their status as population centers, not because of their policy capacities or collective global influence. The question, why do you rob banks? That's because the money, that's where the money is. Why do cities matter? That's because that's where people are. Um, we're all familiar with speeches on why cities matter that begin with demog sweeping demographic numbers that are probably unreliable and also don't help you know how to act locally in any cities. Um, and it's that sort of thinking that was reflected there. By 2015, the US framework has started to shift. The 2015 QDDR, Enduring Leadership in a Dynamic World, identified cities more explicitly as policy actors and innovators in their own right, while still calling attention to global demographic changes. The report emphasized climate change as the illustrative policy area rather than subnational stability and violence, which was the illustrative policy area in 2010. Eyeing the ongoing Paris Agreement negotiations, it also explicitly identified city halls as sources of potential policy innovation. Public facing documents produced by the intelligence community have followed a similar trajectory to that of the QDDRs. The National Intelligence Council issues a benchmark foresight report, Global Trends Every Five Years. The 2012 assessment, Global Trends 2030, identified urbanization as one of the underlying forces behind mega trends in demography and the diffusion of power. The 2021 report, meanwhile, Global Trends 2040, a more contested world, moves well beyond broad demographics, offering a more robust engagement with the ecosystem of city diplomacy, I quote, local and city governments increasingly organized into networks will take action on international issues such as climate change and migration, getting ahead of national governments in some cases, declared the net in what I think is a really striking conclusion. The move from viewing cities as arenas or containers in urbanists speak, to cities as actors is an important analytical jump and one that follows the dramatic expansion of transnational city networks and philanthropic support for city-based climate action. I think it's really interesting, for example, how much Nina and Penny spoke about exchange and local delivery, dialogue with very specific examples without having to make the case of how many people live in New York and Los Angeles. In some ways, you can make the same case for a smaller city that wasn't one of our two uh, largest metropolitan areas, um, and you could deploy the same sorts of efforts. Um, perhaps it's worth discussing whether the, the size of New York and Los Angeles are really integral to what they have accomplished or whether it, it can, in fact, is being um, copied in, and, um, and adopted elsewhere. 
Um, now, what types of actors are cities? And this is just where I'll, I'll, I'll conclude because I, I think it, this is a very open question and one in which I think, I hope students engage going forward in which those of us who practiced uh, city diplomacy could always use help. Um, as, as many know, um, there is moving through Congress or not a, a city and state diplomacy act. Some of the, the panelists here have been very influential in helping support that and, and shape it. Um, in that, uh, it includes, or, or the, the draft uh, legislation includes a crucial definition in its final sentence. Uh, and I'll, I'll read it here because the wording is important. Quote, the term subnational engagement means formal meetings or events between elected officials of state or municipal governments and their foreign counterparts. Regardless of party or level of governance, according to the proposed legislation, the elected part matters. Democracy, in other words, matters, or democratic practices. The Biden administration, I think, appears to take a slightly broader view of, uh, of what type of actors cities really are. In early February 2021, the Memorandum on Revitalizing America's Foreign Policy and National Security Workforce Institutions and Partnerships and the resulting action that followed from it was grounded in a deep knowledge of the Southern National Diplomacy landscape. And they knew of what they spoke. Like the 2015 QDDR, that memorandum from the president highlights climate action, but it goes further than the previous document in acknowledging the leadership role cities have come to play around climate policy. Cities and states, it declares, have shown they can lead on issues such as climate change. Importantly, however, the memo went on, industry also stands on the cutting edge of technological development and is often responsible for securing our critical infrastructure. And social movements advance larger goals by taking coordinated grassroots action. The United States, it continues, must engage with all these actors to best achieve its national security and foreign policy goals. Of course, they're right. But in this reading, cities, the memo suggests, could be one among many partners serving the administration's foreign policy for the middle class. According to the guiding documents of US foreign policymakers then, cities have moved from contested arenas or containers to actors in their own right. But in doing so, they have joined a crowded field of partners, including civil society groups and the private sector, rather than the elite pantheon of governments. Uh, so in closing, I think that one of the open questions we're discussing here today and moving forward, and it really, um, I think is, uh, bears upon Nina's reference to the great work the Pact of Free Cities has done and the response from cities around the world uh, to the war in Ukraine is the question of whether the legitimacy or democratic access, the local um, engagement that cities have uh, matters or um, if really the fact that they, uh, they don't have to be democratically elected, uh, they are one of another actors in the subnational landscape and it is their ability to deliver results um, that is the, the crucial factor or perhaps even all of the above. I look forward to, to discussing that question as well. Great, thank you so much, Ian. Um, we are now going to turn to our fourth panelist, Mr. Luis Renta. Uh, Luis leads the Walmart Policy Lab as of last month, correct? It's very new, an incubator of ideas at the intersection of the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. Previously, he spent 21 years in the public sector focusing on subnational diplomacy and trade policy. Luis started his career working in product management for Unilever. Luis served as assistant executive director at the United States Conference of Mayors, where he oversaw international affairs and trade policy. At the conference, he was instrumental in creating the Urban 20, U20, expanding the global parliament of mayors and securing official mayoral participation in the climate negotiating process, UNFCCC. Previously, Louis served in various positions at the US Department of State, including as a foreign affairs officer in the office of the secretary, as vice chairman of the secretary's open forum and as senior advisor on the intergovernmental affairs staff. Before joining the State Department, Louis spent six years as a trade negotiator for the Caribbean region, working on bilateral trade disputes, regional trade pacts, and multilateral trade agreements. He earned his MPA from Columbia University, a master's in multi-level economic governance from Sciences Po, and a bachelor's in agricultural economics from the University of California, Davis. Over to you, Luis. Well, I think it's obvious that I'm the practitioner and kind of the eclectic person. Pull the mic a little bit. Oh, and uh, 
I'm not sure how to follow Ian's. I mean, uh, there's a lot of open questions there, and I'm fascinated by this sector, as you can see, and uh, and here. I guess what I would say is, um, you know, some of the points that were made uh, need to be more emphasized because I think the folks in in this panel do deserve a lot of credit. Uh, starting, you know, Nina's work on the U20 or uh, Ian's work on the on the uh, on the new urban agenda and so forth. And what I would say is, when I st when I started my career when I was in college, diplomacy was about uh, trade. It was about council affairs. It was about politics and security. And now, diplomacy is about digital. It's about public diplomacy. It's about a lot of different things, including non-state actors. Mm. And so as we think about your career, you know, there's a lot of agency you can have when you work at the local level. Uh, one of the great things about my uh, experience in my career has been that starting working for the Caribbean, if you work in small teams, small countries, you have a lot of room to maneuver. And in that sense, that's very similar to cities, right? There's a lot of things that can be done. So when you think, students, when you think about what to do, it's great to join the State Department, it's great to be a foreign service uh, you know, officer, but you know, going a different, looking at foreign policy with a broader view gives you the ability to really think about where you can make the most impact, right? And the truth is that working on some of these issues, urbanization, for example, um, you know, you could say the same thing about diplomacy, you can say the same thing about development. When I was going to school, development was rural, right? Mm -hmm. The future of development is urban. Most of the populations are going to be in urban places. And so if you think about what it means to be a development professional, it means understanding cities. It means understanding urbanizations. These mega trends are coming together. So um, what I would implore mm -hmm. students to think about and, and, and kind of explore is what in their background, what are their interests, it's best and which level they can actually make the most difference. Because I've seen folks at all levels, where, whether it is you know, at the city level, international, regional, I've had the chance to work at the WTO, I have had the chance to work at the Caribbean for a regional organization. And you can really tell um, you know, that diplomacy is not that narrow thing defined that was when I was in college, it's everything. Right, the, the rise of non-state actors has changed the nature of diplomacy. You know, you could say that uh, companies now have their own foreign policy in a sense, right? Look at what's happened with Ukraine and Disney. Uh, you know, you're, you know, you are, the, your customers are, ex are expecting from you things that we expect from government, and that's new. And so the point here is that. As a student, I mean, I go back to, to my undergraduate days, um, I thought of, uh, you know, joining the diplomatic service or being a diplomat as a very narrow kind of path. And I want to dissuade you from that. It's not that anymore. It's very wide. It's very open. Um, there are plenty of things you can do. Uh, I think it's exciting to go work for Nina or Penny. Um, I think it's interesting to think about how the multilateral organizations integrate these governments. You know, one of the most interesting effects, and I think Ian talked about, about it a little bit, is that the UN and the international system wants to do a lot of things. The bureaucrats in those organizations want to do a lot of things that unfortunately the member countries don't. And cities provide a sense of legitimacy. Right. If you can, if you are, and you know, this past COP, for example, in Glasgow, uh, the Secretary General met with cities, with mayors, as a way of pushing the member countries forward on these issues, because he knows, and the world knows, that cities are much more ahead of this than the member states. We can think about Penny's efforts on the Paris Agreement. I am convinced, and I've said this before, that if the cities and states in this country had not risen up and joined the Paris Agreement, Paris would have gone the way of Kyoto, right? When we pulled out of Kyoto, it was dead, right? 
Why didn't the Saudis, why didn't other countries pull out of Paris? Because they knew clearly from the political will of cities and states that this was a temporary blip in the American political system, that this was going to change. And therefore, even countries that had incentives or were not happy with Paris decided to stay in because they could see the declaration of the mayor of LA or the governor of California. That's power in the international system. And so working in those uh, places is an amazing opportunity to learn and to do a lot. Because uh, let's be blunt, if you start your career as a foreign service officer for the first four or five, six years, you're not going to be doing interesting work. You know, that's the truth, right? It takes some time for you to rise up. You know, I, I, I often tell folks that when I worked for the Caribbean, I didn't have any resources, but I could do whatever I wanted, okay? And when I worked for the U.S. government, I had all the resources in the world, but I could do anything, right? And that is true because we are a huge country with a lot of responsibility. Every action that you take has consequences. Everything has to be cleared. For those of you who know the department, you know, clearing a, uh, working through a clearing tree is one of those magical bureaucratic skills that you gain. And so that different has to be something that a student that wants to be engaged in this space thinks about as they engage, right? And I'm not arguing the one is better than the other. Some of the best uh, uh, city officials that I work with in Penny's office, in Nina's office around the country are former foreign service officers who have left the foreign service and who are now in cities and are working the international portfolio or they're working the trade portfolio or they're working as an advisor to the mayor because there's no official position for international affairs, but they have that kind of portfolio. And so you can think of your career as this kind of hybrid thing where you do one thing and do the other. And the other thing is true. Some of the best foreign service officers that I ever worked for were second career guys. And those of you who know the department, you know, people who did their first career and then came into the department at 35, 40 years old, they have a wealth of experience and they can provide a lot of influence and, and, and uh, take uh, expertise. And so that's kind of the, the thing that I would think of if I'm doing my career. What, where are my chances? Where are my opportunities? Where I'm going to have fun doing things and have an agency where I'm going to learn about the office and international affairs. And if anything, in my career, you realize that, you know, nowadays you're not going to stay anywhere for, for 30 years or 20 years. People are going to jump around, right? And so think about it that way. How, how long you want to spend in, in development, how long you want to spend here in Washington, D.C. It's, uh, it's a fascinating time. I wish I was in your place for those of you who are students, because I, I would love to start from scratch. Uh, I think it's there's an incredible wealth of opportunities to be done in this space. And, and to talk a little bit about what uh, Ian mentioned with the state and local, the city and, um, and state diplomacy act. One of the things we want to do with that, and we were lobbying for, is to take foreign service officers and put them in cities. And this is not a new idea. For those of you who've been in the, around the department, you know, in 1978, the Sec Senator Pearson created something called the Pearson Fellowships, which nowadays are pretty much the way foreign service officers get on the hill. But originally, they were meant for getting foreign service officers to local governments. And this is, you know, 40 years ago. So the idea of engagement has been around for a long time. There were other reasons why he engaged in this, but I think part of that act is about placing 100, 150 point service officers in the United States working for city and local diplomacy to just kind of get a sense of what's going on. And that would be a good start for, for, for the State Department. I'll be quiet there, I'm happy to take any questions. Great, I, I think we should, we'll open this up for questions for the remainder of our time. We've got about 35 minutes together. Um, and I'm gonna kick things off uh, with a question I'll ask all of our panelists to comment on this. Um, we heard different threads of areas of emphasis from all of you. And, and one, of, one of the things that I think is important to understand is uh, to what extent do you see, uh, Ambassador Hashigan mentioned, the role of economic development and FDI? How much of that is, is it a 30% piece of the local government international affairs portfolio? Is this different in every city? Um, what would you recommend for our students 
as they think about this role? Should, should economic development be something that everybody has a little bit of a, a grounding in if they're interested in this space? Um, let me start with Nina, since she mentioned this first, but we can uh, go to all of our panelists. It's sort of as a gateway drug, um, you know, FDI and jobs, like who doesn't want jobs, right? So every mayor can be convinced that they need an international presence uh, or an international capacity to bring jobs. Um, it's also critical, right? It's jobs. So um, I think it very, it's like varied over the time that I've been, uh, you know, in the mayor's office, how much I personally spend on it or my office personally spends on it. But if I have three directors, one of them is doing only that. Um, so to give you just a sense, um, but there've been times I spend a ton of time on it, you know, like preparing for a trade mission or going on a trade mission and, and creating this, this uh, public, public private partnership that we did took a huge lift. Um, but I think it's different in every city. There are many cities with just the one person who does just that. Um, and that's their only international uh, engagement. I want to just say one thing about Penny mentioned budget, and so did so did Luis and and resources. So we, I have zero budget. Um, I have had to raise every dollar that I wanted to spend in one way or another. Um, so that is that is the reality of local government, even in a you know wealthy city, well, or at least part wealthy city like Los Angeles. Um, is that you're always doing more than you can do. You never have enough people and you never have enough money. Um, I, have, I have not ever <laughs> talked to any local official who didn't feel that way. Um, it's also true in the State Department, by the way. Uh, that's, that was kind of the overriding feeling I always had in the State Department. I never had money to do anything. Uh, so, um, you know, that, that is just maybe part of being in government, but you know, you've got private sector partners, there's foundations, there's, uh, you know, individual philanthropists, um, all of whom, you know, can be can be helpful. Uh, and I wanted just to emphasize Penny's point on entrepreneurialism, too. She's so right. Um, I mean, at every, did it go away? Can you hear me still? <laughs> yeah, I, I hear that. You know, very okay, in my back. Uh, anyway, you can be entrepreneurial in government, both at the local level and at the federal level. Okay, great. Penny, to you. Um, you know, to answer your question, the answer is yes, they should. Um, you know, New York's a little bit different in that we have the Economic Development Corporation that is part of the city that has mm. a very significant um, uh, sort of, I'm trying to think of the right word, um, pillar that's focused on international business, but that was a significant part of the work related um, in my office. But, you know, Nina and I were part of the USC Center with local, um, with the local, not local, um, US based international affairs offices. And it really did strike me, you know, whether it was Houston or small towns in the South that had international affairs, they were focused only on economic development. And I think that's okay. That, that was their entry point into the conversation. It was very stressful to continue to prove that, um, prove that concept to their mayors, especially as like political, you know, winds change. But I do think to your your question about should this be a requirement of you know learning for students, um, absolutely. I just feel like because Nina said it, I have to share this. So I've I've been unemployed for the last few months, and I've I've just started to see what I'm going to do next. And in talking to recruiters who have a good sense of what I've accomplished, but then they see the numbers, they're like, "How did you do all that with no money?" <laughs> it's like, "Oh God, yeah." So working in local government is, is a stretch, but it is, um, it is an opportunity to figure out how to build those public-private partnerships, which is incredibly critical for local governments too. So one of the early things in terms of diplomacy is really relationship building, mm -hmm. right? How are you taking and translating the values of your city and what you want to do on these issues to the Walmarts, to the Ford Foundation? Um, and I think that that in itself is training that young people should get in a in a way that like development and fundraising used to have like this like yucky mm -hmm. sense to it um the reality is that's like the foundation of actually how you get a lot of things done ian how would you answer this um well you know in the meta point i think that that i would i would echo nina's uh, uh point about that it, local diplomacy and national diplomacy can be entrepreneurial. It is and should be. Um, I would also add that I don't, I'm not sure it often benefits from being um, 
revolutionary. And so as an example, well, when you're trying to make the case that, that cities matter, you're not trying to make the case that nation states don't. You know, this isn't the end of Westphalia. Um, as a parallel, I don't think that when you're trying to engage with the importance of local diplomacy within the United States, it makes sense to try to say that one should not think about FDI or economic development. I mean, clearly that's what matters most uh, to almost all of our cities or a great number of them and to the, the residents therein. Um, and so you can't make the case that we should be doing local diplomacy, but we should be doing it on something other than what people want to do it on. The only thing I would add to that is, you know, one of the exciting things about this diplomatic practice uh, and, you know, uh, we talked about Penny's awards. I mean, Penny probably knows a lot about Helsinki and the functioning city. Um, and Nina, I bet, knows an incredible amount about Shanghai and the port of Shanghai and some of the really amazing work that they're doing in, between Los Angeles and Shanghai with C40. And so you do get to engage with cities around the world in a way that is a lot like diplomacy um, and is riveting and exciting. One of the, the things that I think comes through when you're doing that, or at least it's my experience, is that um, there are other cities that practice subnational diplomacy who don't put FDI or economic development necessarily as their primary focus. Um, some of them don't because they're well-funded by their national governments because subnational diplomacy is part of national diplomacy. Um, and, and you can look to, to France and Germany in some ways as examples where there is a sort of a rigorous uh, and extended thick conversation between the national government and, and some local um, uh, diplomacy efforts. But also, and, and Nina might have, have, a, have an opinion on exactly how she thinks they approach it, but a city like Buenos Aires is a really fascinating one that, understand, that has a super staffed up and a seemingly well-resourced international affairs office that of course cares about economic development but also really cares about some global challenges and being seen as a leader on those global challenges. So I think that you could choose to, to think about economic development but you can look at many other cities around the world that, that don't put that as necessarily the only or primary issue um, but still think subnational diplomacy matters. Thank you and Luis you've had such a strong trade and economic development background Two points, because um, everything that's been said, I agree with. The first one is that in most local governments here in the U.S. or, or around the world that are democratic, um, FDI and trade promotion is the connection, uh, especially the case here in the U.S., is the connection between the mayor and the private sector, right? And in a lot of cities that are democratic, uh, that's really important. And so there are places like in Oklahoma City it used to be this way, where the FBI was done out of the chamber, mm -hmm. right? The chamber paid for the person to do that for the mayor. And the person was the lead international affairs person for the mayor, paid by the chamber of commerce. So that's the first mm -hmm. thing. It's a, it's a connection. The mayor has to care about it. Therefore, it's important. And therefore, like Nina said, it's, it's, it's an entryway, right? It's, it's a great way to engage. The second point is, you know, the great thing about the United States is that we are a cornucopia of governments. And so, you know, if you go to Houston, their trade delegations are about the oil servicing mm -hmm. industry, right? And if you go to uh, Peoria, Illinois, it's all about Caterpillar, they're a single company town. If you go to Beaverton, Oregon, it's all about Nike. And the mayor travels to China because the mayor has a status in the Chinese system, and therefore Nike needs <laughs> them to open up doors and so on and so forth. So the point here is that every single locality is different and is going to approach this differently, but they all have something to engage in this space. And it's a great place for students to start because it really is at the intersection of the private and the public. Let me ask one follow-up question and then we'll, we'll open this up to everyone. Um, we've talked a little bit in, in all of your opening comments about the importance of city networks that have grown, particularly over the course of the past decade. And these networks have lots of different single areas of focus, right? So with, with the C40, it's climate change. But the Strong Cities Network Okay, we're back, we're back. We lost you for a second, we're back again. Um, maybe, let, let, why don't we ask Ian to, to comment on the, 
many different sets of networks. What would you suggest that students be thinking about and taking a look at? Um, well, uh, I mean, I think we all keep talking about how many the, the incredible panel y'all put together. Um, and, and I think sort of everyone here has experience with, with an array of networks. The thing that's most exciting for the networks, I think, if you're a student and you're thinking about them, is of course you can choose a network based on a single issue. Um, uh, and most of those have slowly creep out to in, 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 encompass other issues um, as well because of uh, the intersections of policy challenges. Um, but the but the thing that's really exciting about the networks, I think, and that uh, and it's in credit to the folks who have built them, is that they they answer the question of scale in a wonderful way. Um, and so I, to simplify them, I mean, there are over 300. Over half of them are, are transnational. Um, they allow cities to do two things. They allow cities to have a collective voice, one, and they allow them to exchange policy very rapidly. Um, they also allow them to be very nimble. If you see what happened around COVID with uh, that, that Nina's probably at the heart of with C40, it's really remarkable that the speed with which um, they can work. Um, and so sometimes it can feel like when you're talking about cities on the global stage, well, what's what, what do we do with a city of 3 million people in a world of 8.5 billion people? Um, but when you can rapidly put together, Twenty-five percent of global GDP and twelve percent of global population, or um, some other cities, uh, some other networks represent huge numbers of people as well. Um, you can scale very quickly, and that has appeal. Um, scale, flexibility, and innovation, and entrepreneurship are some of their qualities, and you don't always get that in um, international diplomacy. Uh, Nina. Yeah, let me just uh, yeah, I can illustrate the point that. Um, Ian was making. So um, the mayor was chair of C40, which is, you know, about 100 megacities during COVID. And um, as soon as COVID hit, he called together a meeting of C40 mayors. There are about 55 of them on the phone. Um, and it was a pretty amazing exchange where you had the um, Milan, which at that point was the complete epicenter. Uh, you had Seoul, which was doing drive-through testing, which other cities eventually emulated, including us, um, and the whole range of experiences in between. And to the point where um, the there were there was a, one in particular mayor who was listening to that call, who then told his national government about what he had heard, and then it influenced national government policy. Um, so uh, we also here in the US were totally on our own in cities. Like, you know, we didn't, there was no federal government really doing much for us. So we had to really network, you know, within the United States and then around the world to kind of figure out what to do. Um, Relatedly, in the same thing, you know, we started we started this gender equity network, right? And we had set up a WhatsApp group of staff to launch the gender equity network in March, uh, March, March thirty first, uh, twenty nineteen. So that didn't happen. Um, and the and the network, uh, this WhatsApp group, immediately turned to a COVID sharing chat, um, and it was kind of amazing. It was like you know, people were asking things like, "Well, what are you? How are you feeding your elderly?" and um, you know, when are you going to reopen schools and, you know, like, and, and, you know, there are PDFs just flying around, you know, on this, in this just simple WhatsApp group, um, that I think informed a lot of, um, you know, decisions in cities. So just, just illustrating Ian's point about scale and speed and flexibility. Any? What you say? I don't have really anything to add. I agree with that. You know, this, this might not be a very popular <laughs> Uh, perspective, but when I first started, the only collective that the city of New York was part of was Sister Cities. Mm -hmm. And I spent the first couple of months like, what the hell is Sister Cities? Like, what are we doing? Like, do you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, yeah. I was just like, wait, and we're paying somebody for this? I was so confused because at that point in 2014, we, the city just wasn't part of anything. I don't even know what existed at the time, but um, what, you know, to Ian and, and Nina's point, everything that we're actively involved with has accountability there are there's measured impact and therefore value for our engagement and covid proved that positive um but it did start with it always seemed like a good idea but it really wasn't until c40 and these other networks got themselves together you really saw 
the measurable impact and value add for you as a city. And now, you know, eight years later, there's some really exciting ones. And to your point, issue, most of them are issue-based. So you get to lean in where the priorities of your administration are, which I think is great. Luis, what would you say? No, I think that's right. Um, you know, I, I, it, I've seen the growth of a lot of networks and a lot of platforms, and they're an exciting part of the ecosystem. I think I learned this from Ian once, which is, you know, they're very unique because most diplomacy happens, you know, behind closed doors, but, but the networks are all about public diplomacy, right, uh -huh. for the most part. And so with the exception of Nina's example, which is a fascinating and an incredible development where now it's not only about what we do publicly and how we make these commitments, but it's also about this instant communication and instant collaboration on an issue that, that we have uh, in common. And I think the future, it's hard to, it's hard to think of a future that that doesn't expand, right? If it worked for COVID, it's gonna work for other things. And if people are going to be more efficient at it, they're going to be more intentional for it. And so 